On today's news, there's teasers of Jeff Hardy joining AEW, a former WWE star's contract has expired, my review of SmackDown, Tempest review of Hook, I mean, Rampage, and more. My voice is still recovering from the work Christmas party where we did a lot of karaoke, so no shouting today. What's that? There was a championship contenders match on SmackDown that ended in a DQ. This. Support WrestleTalk! On Thursday this week, it was reported that WWE had released Jeff Hardy, following an incident at a house show where Hardy was described as sluggish and attempted to leave the match through the crowd. After this incident, it was reported that WWE had offered help to Hardy, including rehab, but the offer was rejected. As such, WWE released him, and he is now reportedly subject to the usual 90-day non-compete clause, which will see him paid until March. However, this hasn't stopped his brother, AEW's Matt Hardy, from drumming up speculation about where he's going and what he's doing next, as he posted this cryptic tweet seemingly in reference to the Team Extreme duo of he and Jeff. I feel extremely good about the future. As of the time of writing, there has been no confirmation of Hardy's release from WWE by the company or from Jeff himself, but Matt commented on a live stream that Jeff was okay and at home. Would you like to see Team Extreme reunite in AEW? Personally, I hope that regardless of his next move, Jeff can get the help he needs before returning to any wrestling ring. Wishing the best for Jeff. It was reported earlier this week that Kyrie Sane might be returning to wrestling after she'd removed the WWE part from her Instagram handle, updated her bios to read former WWE superstar, and teased it herself in a tweet. Now that has been expanded upon by the Wrestling Observer newsletter, as they confirmed that her contract has now officially expired, so she is a free agent. They also noted that she had been offered a new contract to wrestle again in the States, but she rejected this offer. She joins the likes of Johnny Gargano and Kyle O'Reilly, who also had their contracts expire this week. Kyrie's next move is reportedly unknown, as there is nothing set up for a return to stardom or any other promotion currently. It was reported in February this year that Kyrie had asked WWE if she was able to work stardom's biggest show, but the request was denied. WWE's new recruitment program, Next In Line, which I still find hilarious spells nil, has found what WWE are hoping are the next Bella Twins, according to the Wrestling Observer Newsletter. Haley and Hannah Kavinda are 20-year-old twin sisters who both play college basketball for Fresno State University. They both have a growing presence on social media, especially TikTok and Instagram, and according to the newsletter, looks are a part of why WWE is so interested in them, as well as them being great athletes. They are both currently in their junior year in college and are expected to start training in the Performance Center next year. And now it's time for my review of last night's episode of SmackDown, in about five minutes. Thank you for being awesome, Pledge Hammers on Patreon. He's no jackass Dano and fantastic Mr. Good Old Fox. You can get your own shout out and loads of extra bonus content by heading over to patreon.com forward slash wrestle talk. This show started with Sami Zayn, as there was no Roman Reigns on this entire show. Crazy, I know. I can't believe SmackDown wouldn't want to stack this card to the nines when there was Hook in AEW. Sammy's in a wheelchair from his attacks last week and he gets verbally run down by Paul Heyman after he said he was going to sue him for the injuries. But after Sammy threatened Paul and said, because Roman's not here tonight, there's no one left to save him. I mean, the Usos? They're still around. No? Here comes Brock Lesnar anyway, trying to continue to play the whose side is Heyman on story. Sammy and Brock then engaged in some fun comedy saying they should go fishing together and Brock was going to take him away before Heyman interfered saying he didn't know what he was watching. In previous years, this would have been a trip straight to Suplex City. He should have been the reigning, defending, undisputed, universal, etc. And Lesnar snapped, beating up the people helping Sammy in a wheelchair and Sammy. The chemistry between Sammy and Brock is quite good, but I'm kind of over the whose side is Heyman on story, as was also played up later in the show, as Lesnar said Heyman was his advocate, and Heyman got spooked when Kayla Braxton asked him what Reigns would think about what happened tonight. But more importantly, what would Hook think? We then had the undefeated since drafted Los Lotharios taken on Rick Boogs and Shinsuke Nakamura, and Boogs and Nakamura won in, like, a minute. I don't think Lotharios got in a single move. Cool. Well, they would have been the next contenders to the tag titles, but guess not. Nice three-week push you guys had. King Woods has a new crown. It's not good, is it? It's massive. It's too big. Adam Pearce told Drew McIntyre that Sonya Deville was the one who made the list for the Battle Royal, and said the higher authority told him that Drew couldn't take his sword to the ring for his match tonight, so Drew stabbed his desk with it. The visual later of Pearce trying to pull the sword out of the desk was legitimately quite funny, but... Who the hell is the higher authority? If it's Vince, why don't you just call him Vince? He's on Raw, he's a character right now. It's not Vince, is it? It's Hook. Tony Storm told Sasha Banks backstage that Pie backs a bitch. Then we had Sheamus versus Drew McIntyre, which was 
very fun because these two just beat the piss out of each other every time they fight. But this was not built up to in any way and we know this could be like a pay-per-view main event and it would tear the house down. Drew won with a claymore. Mad Cat Ross and Happy Corbin then stole Drew's sword. Oh joy. Naomi and Sonya Deville came next except it didn't, as Sonya had Natalia and Shayna Baszler as a special guest ring announcer and timekeeper respectively. But then they swarmed the ring to try and beat down Naomi, but that's when we got the debut of Zia Lee. Okay, positives. I like that Zia Lee's character was built up to be a protector and fighter against injustice, and the first thing she does is try and protect Naomi from a numbers advantage. Thumbs up for that. She's doing something meaningful. Thumbs up for that. She helped Naomi beat up the three of them and looked good doing it. Thumbs up for that. And the negatives. I've seen some people really like her entrance with the big CG stuff around her like she's a superhero, but I personally just think it looks very goofy and it just doesn't work because shockingly, she's not actually a superhero, guys, and she doesn't have all these like powers and energy coming off her. It just doesn't work for me. It also didn't help when Pat McAfee said, is that the most intimidating thing I've ever seen? No, Pat, it probably isn't. Have you seen Hook? RK Bro then had a chat with the cast of Jackass Forever backstage. I'm sure Luke enjoyed it. Charlotte Flair then took on Tony Storm in a championship contenders match. Strike one. The match lasted three minutes. Strike two. And it ended in DQ. Strike three. Charlotte got herself intentionally disqualified after not stopping for a referee's count of five, which means Tony actually got a title shot out of it. What is the f point of anything that happens in this feud because Charlotte didn't know who Tony was, didn't want to have a title match, thought she wasn't worthy, and then ensured she actually got one by getting DQ'd. This is one of the worst major feuds WWE have done in a while, an absolute show every week. How hard is it to treat your fresh new face as well and build them up for big title matches by, I don't know, winning matches? And before someone comments that technically she did win, technically you can f She's had four matches since debuting. She's won three of them. That's good. But two of them are by DQ and by Countout. And she lost in the first round of the Queen's Crown Tournament. And she hasn't been protected at all. Brock Lesnar then tells Adam Pearce backstage a long story about hunting a moose and snapped a phone. Okay. And the main event was the Usos versus the New Day versus RK Bro. And what was advertised as, who is the best tag team in all of WWE? Now I know what you're thinking. RK Bro are from Raw. How did they explain them being on SmackDown? They didn't. They they just didn't. And considering the match features two sets of tag team champions, it makes total sense that the winners were the one team who weren't champions? Alright. New Day won and they pinned the Usos. Remember when everyone was super excited for Jey Uso to turn on Roman Reigns and some called for him to win the Universal title because the story was so good? Nah, me neither. And on a show with no Roman Reigns, the show ended with a video package for Roman Reigns because they just can't help themselves. That was the show, leave a comment about it and vote on the community tab poll where 86% of you correctly voted for Hook. This was a bad show. It had some superficially fun moments like Drew versus Sheamus and the main event and the chemistry of Sammy and Brock is good, but I'm not invested in the story. Two out of five. And now over to Tempest for a review of last night's episode of AEW Hook. You can see in real time on this show the support of Hook switch from ironic to genuine. What's going on WrestleTalk friends and fans? Tempest is back with another review of AEW Rampage in about three minutes. So this show opened with the AEW World Tag Team Championship match as FTR took on the Lucha Brothers. Ray Phoenix is genuinely one of my favorite wrestlers to watch in the entire world. And when you compare him opposite FTR with their much more old school style, it just makes for an excellent clash of styles, what can I say? Even Tully Blanchard had to get in on the action, although I bet he wish he didn't. Ultimately, it was the Lucha Brothers who retained their titles over FTR. I would like to think that this rivalry has now been put to bed, but what a match to go out with. This gets a five out of five. We then got a six woman tag team match as Ruby Soho teamed up with Ty Conti and Anna Jay to take on Nyla Rose, Penelope Ford, and The Bunny. I would like to see many more of these type of matches be featured on Rampage. It just allows so many more characters to be allowed time on screen. The main selling point for this match of course was the upcoming TBS Championship semi-final match between Nyla Rose and Ruby Soho, and we got plenty of play between those two in this match. But in the end, it was Nyla Rose who would come out on top, gaining the momentum after a huge beast bomb on Ty Conti. I gotta say, I really love the presentation of the TBS Championship tournament, and that each of these big matches gets like an extra week to have build. This was very fun stuff, this gets a 4 out of 5. Then we got... the match. There's life, and then there's larger than life. And then there's the debut of Hook. After a year of standing behind Team Taz and months of anticipation of send Hook, Hook 
has been sent. No, but actually, Hook did really well in his debut match against Fuego Del Sol, picking up the win with the Taz mission because, well, of course. Considering how unimportant the debut of Hook would have been just a year ago, AEW has masterfully capitalized on the hype that has been added to him by the wrestling community. This debut meant something. This was the best debut in the history of wrestling. This gets a 10 out of 5. And then we got the main event match as Adam Cole took on Wheeler Yuta. Wheeler Yuta has been one of my favorite young talents that's been brought in by AEW. And of course, Adam Cole is just Adam Cole. It's crazy how you could possibly let that guy's contract expire. Real story of this match was that Orange Cassidy was looking on at Adam Cole menacingly. Wheeler Yuta did his best, but it's not his job to win in matches like this. Adam Cole picks up the win, keeping his winning streak alive. I'm sure we're going to see a match between him and Orange Cassidy in the near future. Sign me up for that. I thought this was a very fine main event. If you can have guys like Adam Cole wrestling up and coming stars like Wheeler Yuta or John Silver, you're gonna have good main events every week. This was really, really fun. I'm giving this a four out of five. So overall, I thought this was a very good return to form for Rampage. You got a very important AEW World Tag Team title match, as well as the most important debut in the history of wrestling, and then a good main event with Adam Cole. For how much fun everything was on this show, I think this was a five out of five. This is a 5 out of 5 because I say so. And that's just about wraps up for me. If you want to hear more of my thoughts on this week's Rampage and last night's SmackDown, make sure you go over to WrestleTalk Podcast later on today, where myself and Chopper Pete will be breaking down both shows in complete detail. LIW is fine! Stop talking about how fine we are! We're fine. In the years that have passed since the launch of All Elite Wrestling, the war with WWE has evolved. Now the two promotions don't spend nearly as much time counter-programming each other as they did in the early days of the Wednesday Night War, but the war itself is still very much alive. With AEW continuing to gain traction and WWE continuing to sabotage their own public perception within the wrestling community, there have still been a number of moments where the two companies have been at odds with each other.